This is an SBC Media Partners production. Swung on, hit high and deep. Right Phillies fans, these are your glove stories with Murph. Check out with Greg Murphy. Murphy, you got a special guest, huh? Hi, everyone, and welcome to Glove Stories with Murph, uh, another edition. And we're really excited to uh, welcome in this week's guest. Uh, you probably know him nowadays from his work on NBC Sports Philadelphia in the studio with Michael Barkan as a Phillies pre and post game host. But, uh, well, Phillies fans also remember him as an all-star back in 1996. He was a a closer for this Phillies team in the mid-90s and just a terrific personality and a good friend. Ricky Metallico joins us today on Glove Stories. Hey, bud. Good to see you. What's going on, Murph? I am. By uh, the way, I think they know me from being with Murph on CSN back in the day. I I don't think. I think you've had other accomplishments uh, sitting next to me, probably not one of the better ones. Um, But, uh, you know, it's funny because part of the reason we started this podcast is because I've had the ability to sit with guys like yourself and, and hear the stories of your playing days and even before your playing days. And, and that's what we're trying to do here on glove stories. So let, let's get started with Ricky Boat because I know you as a, a you know, high energy guy in the studio um, you know, always passionate about the game of baseball. I have to imagine from a wee age, little Ricky Bo was probably terrorizing the house and, uh, you know, throwing mud pies at girls and doing all kinds of stuff like that. When you were a little kid, what were you like as a, as a youngster? Yeah. Little Ricky was a little bit out of control. I think I was just, <laughs> I was one of those kids that always was a ball of energy, always wanted to do something, but it, it like back then though, it was the whole neighborhood was like that. So yeah. it was, it was, and I wasn't just a baseball player. I, I like to consider myself a little athlete at the time. You know, I love, I love playing basketball, football, right. hockey, both ice and street hockey, uh, baseball, and it was really whatever season it was. So if it was cold out, you had to get guys together to play street hockey. If it was really cold and the ice was good, you wanted to go out and play on the ice, put your skates on. And then once once it warmed up, I think my biggest passion, obviously, was baseball. Um, you know, I had two older brothers, and I think this really helped me. And and for kids nowadays, I think this is this should go into their brains and stick with them especially if you have older brothers in the neighborhood, they used to play baseball games every single day. Okay. So I wanted to play, you know, my brothers would say, well, you're too small. Well, they finally started letting me in these games at like six, seven years old. And I'm facing nine, 10, 11 year olds at that point. And it only made me better. And it only made me, you don't accept failure. You try to work through failure because when you're playing with your older brothers and their older friends, you're going to fail a lot. Yeah. But you're also going to learn to be more competitive. So I think that helped me in the long run. And then I finally get, you finally get to Little League. At that point, you couldn't start Little League till nine years old. <laughs> Are you kidding me? I was, you know what? Forget it. Diapers were gone. Everything was gone. I will say this much. And this is the, the biggest truth I could tell you. My mother was my biggest fan when I was a little kid. She used to ask me every single day from when I was like five or six years old, what do you want to do with your life? I used to say, I want to be a major league baseball baseball player Murph the biggest problem was I wanted to be a catcher okay <laughs> but but I ended hey. up whatever I, path I ended, right ended up being a pitcher that was fine but the first day before I, I'll never forget um we're, we have my first little league game opening day is the next day I went to bed full uniform by the way including <laughs> a cup including a jock strap everything my mother was like getting me up I, I remember it was a Saturday morning she's waking me up I was fired up, ready to go full. She's like, you wore your uniform. I was like, yeah, I did. I'm ready to go. Let's, of course let's I go did. play some baseball. I was fired up, man. There was nothing like that first day every year. Nothing of that story surprises me at all. Uh, that is exactly how I would picture you as you were getting ready for your first little league. Game. Broke a lot of windows at my parents' house when I was a little kid. Too. I, I'm sure you did. And that's what, you know, and you played the game that way your entire life and we'll, and we'll get to that uh a little yeah, bit later but that, fire. Yep. yeah and 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 i love it and, th- and i think that's what made you uh such a fan favorite in philadelphia because th- that's the way 
we want our ball players to play. By right. the way, I used to tell my parents that I wanted to be a major league baseball player too. And I only ended up in the broadcast booth. So you, even though you weren't a catcher, you made I just a- have to <laughs> switch positions, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I really switched, <laughs> but I, I mean, switched right on out. Funny, funny story is I actually was the emergency catcher in Philadelphia. Yeah. Oh, for, I, I for remember one year. that. I mean, sure. Well, because I remember we were without a catcher and I had, I had equipment, everything in the bullpen catching bullies. It was great. Yeah. And you were still sleeping with your cup on. So that was good. So yes, I was, <laughs> I still do it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right. So tell me a little bit about, you know, we, we think about Connecticut where you grew up and, and you think, uh, you know, you mentioned hockey. Yeah. Okay. A lot of hockey players probably come out of Connecticut. Not a lot of baseball players coming out of Connecticut, but that's not exactly true. The league that you're playing in, you guys, that's a pretty good talent. Yeah, it wasn't true. I mean, before I got to high school, there wasn't many. And if there were any, it was very, you know, top line guys, the the very top. And that was it because mm-hmm. being in Connecticut, there's one, there weren't a lot of scouts there. You mm-hmm. might get looked at by somebody and then kind of glanced over. Um, but in my just in my conference in, in high school, we had Jeff Bagwell, who was played for Xavier High School, and I went to the South Catholic High School. So there were two major leaguers right there. Pretty good that, player that, there. Yeah, yeah that, that uh, you know, went to the majors. The funny thing is, is in high school, I was the hitter, and he was the pitcher. Because <laughs> – he was, he, he played shortstop, but he pitched sure. a lot. And I remember I hit a ball about 400 feet off of him one day. And I was like, yeah, that's right. Bagwell take that, you know? <laughs> yeah. You're so, never going to amount to nothing. <laughs> he had the last laugh, but he yeah, never he, got he, me in the big leagues, but it, it's funny because I made all state my senior year of high school as a catcher. And, um, I remember Rico came over to the Philly Rico Bronia came over to the Phillies and he's like, Hey, have you ever checked out our all state? picture i'm like you were in that and he's like yeah because we we had the same size school so there's what 14 guys that make the all-state team and both of us were on it i went and looked at it It was me him osmus and i forgot the fourth one but all of us had made the major leagues there were four guys out of those 14s that actually made the major leagues and uh you know for me it was just play as hard as you can see what happens i thought i was going to have a chance out of high school but like my last we didn't play enough games yeah that's and that's the thing enough games right and i was yeah. small i mean i was five eight my senior year maybe 150 pounds soaking wet right. so i was really small i was a late bloomer i was only 17 when i graduated yeah yeah and and so you know and that's the thing so then you go off to college you go down to florida for a short period of time but then you come yeah. back and you're playing for central connecticut and uh you know, a, a really good career at Central Connecticut. And that's yeah. where you made the switch uh, to start pitching, right? An a- accidental switch. Uh, I was actually catching a game at the University of Fairfield during the week. And I believe it was like during exams. So if you had an exam a day or whatever before or after, you couldn't go. Okay. Uh, or it was a day after you couldn't go or two days after. And so we had a short squad. And there were a lot of pitchers missing because I'm sure it was one of those classes that all the yeah. all the baseball <laughs> all the athletes players, are taking. But, yeah. Um, but um, our starting pitcher, Todd Martin, got hurt. I'll never forget. And I was catching at the time. I remember walking out the mound. He's like, I think it's my elbow. I was like, the, the manager came out and he's like, well, I don't have a top. I said, I'll pitch. We got three catchers here. I'll pitch. So I went in and there was bases loaded in the fourth inning. I ended up striking out the side and then struck out nine more after that. Okay. So that was pretty much the end of my catching career for the most part. I mean, I might've caught a game or two after that, but it was kind of starting to groom me as a pitcher. Yeah. Well, that makes a lot of sense. You're throwing hard, obviously. Yeah. I'm sure your manager in the, uh... In college now, I was like, yeah, I'm the one that switched him over to be a pitcher. I saw oh, he, it right away when I... When he I, died. He <laughs> died, so I don't think he's saying too much. Oh, all right, well, then we'll move on from him. You know, you don't get drafted out of college, um, and you start in independent ball. And independent ball, I well, mean... Well, no, no, no. It was actually beer league. It was, well, I, oh, guess right. you would call, I guess you would call it a, a semi-pro a men's, league. Yeah, semi-pro men's yeah. league. And I, I was going to say, you, you have to... You have to love the game of baseball if you're going to continue on yeah. and play the game at that point. But you obviously did, and you obviously thought, you know what? I'm not, I'm not giving up the dream just yet. 
Well, I didn't, I didn't necessarily go. I still had one more eligibility year of college. So it was kind of just honing skills, staying in shape and playing some baseball uh, in the summer. And man, I ended up, uh, I would catch every game and then pitch every like fourth day. It wasn't really even every fifth day. And then all of a sudden I'm noticing, well, I'm getting a lot of shutouts, I'm getting a lot of strikeouts. I don't even have an ERA. I mean, that's how, that's, that's how it was going. And that was basically off of a fastball and I was throwing kind of a, a splange, I call it. It's between a split and a change, but I had like breaking stuff, but I never had to use it in that league. So when scouts would see me, their first thought was, man, good fastball, but I don't see much on the off speed stuff. So Phillies got wind uh, at the B, middle of July that I was going to have a tryout with the Oakland A's coming up, which yeah. was going to be at Holy Cross University in Massachusetts. And it was going to be a private one. Um, and they basically said, hey, can he pitch on two days rest? Because we're going to send three scouts over to see him. I did. I pitched on three days rest. They signed me in between games of a doubleheader, and that was that. I went on. But the funny thing is, is I just said they didn't know I had a breaking pitch. Right. I, I get sent to Batavia, New York to throw for their pitching coaches, and then I was getting shipped to Martinsville. So it was like bang, bang. I got shipped to Batavia. I go and just throw a bullpen in Batavia. And um, he's like, all right, fastballs. I throw – it was Carlos Arroyo. I, I'm sure you know the name. Absolutely. Of and he goes, all right, let's see your break and stuff. So I dropped the curveball. And as you know, you've seen, I had a really, really good curveball. And he goes, do that again, do that two or three times. So I threw about three of them and they were all nasty. He said, wait right here. He walked into the clubhouse, brought out my scouting report and it said curveball N-A. And, and I was like, what are you talking about? I said, I got a great curveball. And he, he looked at me and he said, you're going to be on the fast track right now. And he goes, we're going to send, he goes, I'm going in telling them to send you to Martinsville, have you throw one game, then start. And in my first, first game in Martinsville, I did all right. I struck out like there are two number ones. One of them was Demetri Young. First guy I faced three pitches, Demetri Young. Okay. And right after that, I was like, man, I think I could do this. I mean, you're facing a number one pick and you're a nobody and come in and make him look stupid on three pitches. I was like, I'm on the right track. And my first game I started was in Martinsville, Virginia. And I'll never forget. I had a perfect game through seven and a third, seven and two thirds with all the Philly scouts there. And I ended up uh, pitch count wise, I guess maybe a little high gave up a, an error, I think, and then got pulled. And I ended up, I ended up getting the loss. <laughs> I didn't give up a run Ouch. while I was on the field, but I got, well, I, I think somebody came and walked a guy then a home run and we ended up losing three to nothing or something like that. Oh man. That's, that's funny. Well, yeah. you know, and, and it just goes to show and, and just to back up. And I, I think this part of the story is true, or maybe it's urban legend, but in between that double header, when the Phillies signed you, yeah. you, you did it in the, in the front seat of your dad's car. Or no, you, back, back seat of a back car, seat of the car, back seat of the, uh, the scouts. It was Dick Lawler. <laughs> Dick Lawler was there. He's Didn't like, make this stuff up. Well, it started raining. So he's like, come in the car, blah, blah, blah. He goes, do you want to play for the Phillies? I'm like, yeah. He goes, do you want to sign a contract right now? I was like, absolutely. So great. It, it, so great. I, and they gave me like a $1,600 signing bonus back yeah. on the back thing. But you were, and you thought you were as rich as could be at that point. Oh, you kidding me? Yeah. <laughs> great. That is such, such a great story. And then psyched. you didn't spend a whole lot of time in the minor leagues. You were on the fast track, which, yeah. would, which was great. But I want to pause and, and ask you about the minor leagues, just specifically 1993, because yeah. here you are, a step away from the big leagues. But meanwhile, up at the big league club, it's a magical season happening 1993 with all those yeah. crazy, you know, with the crazy guys. And I would imagine you as part of the organization, that was a pretty exciting time. And, and maybe in the back of your head, you're like, Oh man, if I could just get up there. Well, it, it was interesting because I was throwing the ball uh, very well. I went from, I think Clearwater, And then we had the, the game where Scranton plays against the Phillies. Yep. Yep. I was put on the Phillies team. Normally they send guys up and they'll put them on the other roster to just so the Phillies could see them. They put me on the team with them. So I ended up throwing in that game after that game. 
I mean, mind you, all my stuff is in Clearwater. They're like, you're going to Reading right after the game. So right. I got promoted right there. And in Reading, I just found my stride. I mean, I loved Carlos Arroyo as my pitching coach. He was probably the one guy that could always keep me on an, on a lower type level than I'm usually way up here. He kind of brought me down a little bit. And on August 26th of that year, I got called in the office. We're in, I'll never forget this. I was in Albany, New York. Get called in the office. You don't know what you're getting. I thought maybe I'm going up to Scranton. You know, that's right. They're like, uh, you're going to Philly. I'm like, what? They're like, uh, you're going up to Philly. They want you for the playoffs. So you're going up on, on August 28th. They just have to make some moves to clear a spot for you. That was it. So they took my spikes. They took my gloves. They took, took everything from me. In, in Reading, all I could do was go out and run. I couldn't do anything. So we come in on Sunday. I, have, I had my plane ticket, everything, and get called in. Well, this is the first time I have to do this. You're not going up. Wow. Yeah. And the next year, Dancy, same place. We're in we're in Albany again. And Bill Dancy was the coach there. And he knew what had happened to me last year. So he's like, Man, I got bad news for you again. He goes, You were supposed to get called up. And I kind of looked at him and, and I'm looking around and Dave Hayden, he was one of my best friends on the team. And Tommy Eason, another good friend of mine on the team. And then the bus driver's in there to coach. I'm like, no, what's going on? Yeah, this this is happening now, right? <laughs> yeah, you're you're going to you're going to Atlanta. I said, I got traded. And he said, No, team's in Atlanta. He goes, You're leaving tomorrow morning. Good luck. I said, You're joking, right? And he was like, he was dead serious, man. I could not tell you a better. You know why you'd want to get on a phone? I, I don't I hate phones. I hate call. I wanted to call everybody I knew yeah. at that point. That was yeah. the best moment of your life. You find out that you're going to the big leagues. Yeah. It was unreal. It, I, I can only imagine. And you know, I, I ask everybody who comes through the program uh, about this moment because you've all shared it, but so few people on the planet get to share it. Right. And uh, you make that major league debut. You get the call and then you make the debut and and for you Debut went really well. You, you know, you pitched yeah. a scoreless inning, I think. I got, I, I, I was tomahawk chopped in my first game. So hey, it, it couldn't get it any worse. I'll, I'll never forget, though. You walk on the field. I'm not kidding you, Murph. You've been, you've been to every major league stadium. Yeah. Whenever it's a sold out, and it was sold out, trust me. And it was a hazy night. And I'll never forget, walk down the mountain, and everybody was telling me, Carlos Arroyo said, enjoy it. Take a good look at where you are. And when I got out to, I was nervous in the bullpen. I got out to the mound. I looked around. I'm like, I don't really hear the people. It's like above my head. And it feels like they're cardboard cutouts in the stands. Because that's what it looked like to me. Well, foreshadowing and, and there. I remember I said that to, uh, well, yeah, I guess yeah. so. Huh? <laughs> but I, I, I remember uh, I got sent down because of the back down because of the strike. And I told Carlos what it sounded or looked like and felt like. And he said, he goes, you were locked in. You, did, you weren't really as concerned about the people in the stands as, as a lot of people are. It, it, and it's amazing because I've heard that kind of sentiment from others about how you just you don't even real you don't even hear it you, you know right. if you're in the crowd it's it, it, the building is shaking yeah but for you out there on the mound 60 feet six inches away you've got a job to do everything else is kind of just it's, it's really above your head yeah. like when i say that it, the sound you could hear like a, a slow roar but you don't hear the whole thing the only place i ever heard it was do you remember going to Colorado? How loud it was oh, when yeah. it was packed. Yep. When that place was packed, it was. I mean, it would shake you. That's yeah. how. That's how loud that place was. But even there, I would hear it in the bullpen. But as you got down onto field level, you don't hear it as much. Yeah, it's kind of cool. All right, let me jump ahead because uh, 1996. We well, you had a terrific year in '95, yeah. and, and then 1996. Uh, you're an all-star. And yeah. I, I, I was reading a story about the, the moment that you got a chance to tell your mom and dad that you became a major league all-star, which was a goal of yours from being very little. Well, the thing is, is I th when you when you're playing, you know who's in the running for it. You knew you were in the running for yeah. it. But I had a bad game the day they were picking. And I was like, I, I think I had a one ERA. And then all of a sudden I have this game where I give up three quick runs and I'm like, 
I just blew my all star appearance. Like I'm thinking that after I was right. done. Right. And but I mean, you know what? Yeah, you call your parents and you could hear how proud they are in their voices. Mm-hmm. And it and it's a it's a different pride because it, it, it my mother's crying, my father's like, yeah, had a boy, way to go, type <laughs> thing. And and uh uh, and I think my, you know, my brother's more or less, you should have made it last year. <laughs> you right. know? Exactly. Well, yeah. So, yeah. But, but it's, there's always a little something. I thought the hardest thing about that was because it was in Philadelphia. The game. Yep. Man, I, yeah, the game was in Philadelphia. Number one, I had a townhouse in over in Jersey at, at that point. So family took that over. So I had family, friends, aunts, uncles, cousins coming in. And all of a sudden, I'm like, I don't have enough rooms. Now I got to find hotel rooms. I have to find more tickets. It became a almost a, that was Part-time more weighing job. on my shoulders than pitching yeah. in the game at that point. Yeah. But my grandmother was the only one that couldn't go or didn't go. And I gave her the old high gram on the hat during introduction. So she was happy. And yeah. I, I don't know. It was it was definitely a, a completely different ball game when you, when I stepped on that in, into that situation. Yeah. And you're looking around and they're the best players in the world yeah. surrounding you. Bobby Cox was your manager. He's the guy. Yeah, that I was, I was 24 years old. And yeah. I was scared to death. So yeah. There's no doubt about it. Well, it's an amazing moment, but you know, All Star Week is is a special moment for for the guys, especially someone making their first All Star yeah. appearance. Uh, a few days before the game, you're playing in a celebrity softball game, and uh, well, you've made made fast friends with a, a rock and roll legend, did you not? Well, yeah, it was Meatloaf. I mean, it's just <laughs> it's just weird because you see these people on. T- I guess it's the same for them looking at us. You see sure. them on TV all the time, and you kind of you know who they are and you look at them as big rock stars and this, and he like grabbed me and he was like, Hey buddy, blah, 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 I'm a big fan of yours. I've been watching you since you came up. I, you know, you're doing a heck of a job for the Phillies. I was like, you gotta be kidding me. And then um, there was another one. Uh, Jonathan Silverman was there. Oh, sure. Yeah. The he, he was, he was, yeah. he was actually a really nice guy. It was just weird. I mean, cause I didn't feel like I belonged. You know what I mean? You know yeah. how you feel like, I'm in this place, but I feel like I'm the one person standing outside the bubble. That's how I felt. And I'm sure you're not the only one that felt that way. Yeah. No, but it was pretty cool because I mean, in the, they had a program and in the program, Los Lobos was a pretty good, pretty big brand back then. And they said like their favorite, you know, they have the little bios in there. It said favorite, you know, player was me. I don't know if that was just thrown in there or not, but it was pretty cool to have. <laughs> hey, it, it, that's so cool. I mean, and I hosted this week in baseball that week. I didn't know that. Yeah, I, right. did. I hosted this week in baseball that week. So I had to wear the beginning mic. of your TV career. You, you know, people wear one mic. Yeah, I had like nine on me. <laughs> it was ridiculous. I had them in the back front everywhere. It was crazy. Yeah, what a great memory. And uh, and you pitched well in the game, too. That's, that's did, secondary. Yeah. You came out and I, pitched well. I did. Uh, I got the opportunity to pitch to uh, Cal Ripken in that game after he had broken his nose the day before. Right, yeah. Um, so it was very much stay middle to middle away with Cal. <laughs> so we tried. Yeah, he broke his nose getting the team photo taken or something yeah uh hernandez actually accidentally yeah. smacked him in the in the face nice <laughs> you huh? can't make this stuff up but but no, as can. cal does cal played that's the way yeah. that's the way he did it um before i before i let you go uh i you know you just mentioned hosting um uh this week in baseball the television career when this when the when it was all said and done in your playing career, I mean, 12 years in the big leagues, uh, parts yeah. of 12 years in the big leagues, uh, then you make the transition and you stay in Philadelphia. And, you know, people will often say to you, and I, and I know you, that, you know, wow, you get so fired up, you get so angry, you get yeah. so passionate. And, and you know, they say it to me too. We, you and I worked together for years, and I always say that's, that's the way Ricky approached the game when he was a player. He, he cared so much about the game and the way it was played and, and you still do, right. but there's a moment that I think kind of showed your true colors as an analyst. And that was back when the 08 team was in the postseason, and you were on the set with Michael Barkham, uh, Darren Dalton and, and yourself and the cameras were rolling, but you guys weren't on television yet. You were watching the game and Jimmy Rollins, sits the double in, yeah. in LA. Go no, ahead. No. And, and well, it was, it was that, it was that. Oh yeah. It was, at Citizens Bank Park, and yeah. and you they captured this off the the cuff moment of the three of you, yeah. 
jumping up and down and cheering and high-fiving. And to me, I remember seeing that and going, that these guys love this team. These guys I love do. this game. And this city, I think, fell in love with you guys. Well, you know, Dutch had already had yeah. this. But I think that moment for all of you guys was such a special moment. It was, to me, that was like, man, we've been waiting for this for so long, and there it is. Yeah. And, and you have to understand, I was – the importance of that game was huge for the Phillies, I think. And I think yeah. you could see the importance in our faces. Well, on the far camera or on the far uh, monitor was a live shot, you know, in the studios, sometimes there's live, sometimes it's a little delayed. Yep. Well, I could, I'm the only one that could see the, the uh, live one. And I'm saying that's going to win the game. And Michael's like, Nope, Nope. I said, yes, it is. <laughs> and he hadn't seen it yet. So he didn't know what I was talking about at first. Yeah. So, yeah. but yeah, yeah, but yeah, I mean, I, I obviously, I, I feel like um, I'm like more family with the Phillies. I played on other teams, yep. but it was the team I wanted to come back to in 2001, 2002. And it, it's just, it, it's, it's always in your heart. You know what I mean? They're the team that took a chance on me. So uh, I played for them for what, five or six years. And that's the team that's that's closest to me. And I, I, I obviously want them to win all the time. And when they don't, it ticks me off, especially when, <laughs> well, I mean, especially when it's not played right. Right. You know, if something's not played right, that's sure. when you're going to get the biggest rise out of me. Yeah, no doubt about it. And it's all done because of, of your passion for the organization and your passion for the game of baseball, which is what makes it so special in my opinion. And uh, I try. Was, it was a lot of fun being on the other side of it with you. And, and it's always a lot of fun continuing. Sometimes to watch you it. wanted to do this. <laughs> Sometimes I'd crawl under the table and try to get you, away, but you, you know, had this shirt that had the arrow that said, I'm not with him. <laughs> yeah. I'm not with Ricky Bo. Absolutely. Hey, I really appreciate you spending a couple minutes with us. Uh, some great glove stories. I knew you would have a bunch and you did. Um, I got more. So, uh, thanks for sharing them with us this time. Thanks, Murph. Thanks for having me. All right, Ricky Batalico. We'll be right back after this. And welcome back to Glove Stories with Murph. And we welcome back in Charlie Manuel, who is reliving the 2008 season with us. Uh, one game at a time as we get all the way to that magic moment in October. But, Charlie, I'm going to take you to Sunday, June 6th. The Phillies were on the road in Atlanta. It was game number 63 on the season, so 99 games to play at that point. The team had won eight of the last 10, and they extended their lead to two and a half games over the Marlins at that time, three and a half over the Braves, and they head to Atlanta to start a nine-game road trip. First game of the series, Jamie Moyer and Tim Hudson, and we all know what Tim Hudson was able to do, especially in his prime, but you jump on him early, Rollins flies out to right, Victorino triples, and once again, Utley is there in the middle of it, a double, and he knocks in the run. Sure was. You know, like I could, I can, uh, I can definitely uh, remember a lot about this game right here, Tom, because you know, like uh, always, uh, we always like, uh, I always kind of like Hudson to pitch against us because Howard used to hit him good. If you remember, he used to get some extra yeah. base hits off of him if you go back and check, and. Uh, and this is this. I, I remember this game, and I remember Utley uh, hitting a homer too. Yeah, I mean it was a. Uh, it came at a big time for us too because it was early in the game, and it got us out. It got us on the board. Got you on the board, and always good to get ahead and jump on uh, the you know the best players uh, early because uh, you know they kind of settle in, and that's exactly what happened. It was a pitcher's duel. Moyer allowing just two hits through five innings. Hudson equally good after the first one, nothing fills in the sixth, but then Moyer starts to get a little shaky, allows a single to Mark to gets Jeff Francoeur to pop out the shortstop. Then Brian McCann hits a two run shot. So it's two, one Braves. The next batter would triple off of Moyer and you had seen enough. You go out and take the ball from Moyer and you bring Chad Durbin in when, when Jamie started to lose it, it kind of often went kind of quick. Yeah. Jamie, uh, like, uh, uh, like, like I always used to talk about, Jamie was a, was the kind of guy you know, like you get when once he got up across that ninety percent, uh, ninety uh, ninety pitch mark, you had yeah. to really watch him. And he used to tell me all the time about that. He he told me he said you got to keep watching me, man. man. You know, make sure you come and get me. And 
I, I can remember the game and I can remember, you know, like I thought, I, I remember telling Doobie in that game, I said, hey, look, it's time for me to go get him. And I, I remember going out and taking him out. Yep. And so Chad Kurt Durbin comes in and locks things down. So that was exactly what you were looking for. But top of the ninth now, things not looking as good. The Braves bullpen gets the first two Phillies batters. Then with two outs, Jeff Jenkins walks. Bruntlett comes in to pinch run. I want to ask you about that yep. in a second. He pinch runs for Jenkins. He promptly steals second base. Next batter, ground ball to second. Error on the second baseman. Bruntlett comes around to school and all uh, around to score, and all of a sudden we're tied at two. Kind of like the baseball gods working in your favor yeah. on that one, Charlie. But uh, yeah. you know the idea of pinch running there for Jeff Jenkins with some speed and Bruntlett, it paid off for you. Yeah, well, you know, like I, uh, I can remember that. I looked, uh, I thought that day uh, I, when I looked over, it was all, it was two outs already. And, uh, you know, like, and I knew who, uh, if he gets thrown out, you know, like I knew who was going to lead off the next inning, but at the same time, I wanted him in scoring position. Yeah. And, uh, you know, like we, uh, we, we did a lot of studying, of course, with the, on the catchers and, and, uh, and the pitcher. And, you know, like that was a good guy for, uh, uh, Lopes did a good job sending him there, Tom. Actually, I, I, if, if, if I remember right, you know, like I didn't put a sign on, I, I think Lopes, did, you know, told him to go. <laughs> he had a feel for it, that yeah. Davy Lopes, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, he, could, he could see, hey, Tom, he could see things, uh, Tom, I'm Greg, I mean, <laughs> he, 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 he could see things I couldn't see, really. No, I, it, it's amazing to watch when he was yeah. coaching first base to watch him work, no doubt yeah. about it. All right, so we're headed to extra innings now. The team, once again, coming back late, tying it up, so we head to the extra innings. Chris Snelling doubles to start the inning for the Phils. So Taguchi comes in now. He pinches pinch runs for uh, Snelling. Jimmy moves him over to third. Next batter up, Shane Victorino. Well, he triples, and Taguchi scores, yeah. and up comes Utley next. He doubles, and all of a sudden, you're up 4-2. Uh, exactly. We're up 4-2, to two and you're like a uh, uh, big hit, big time. You know, like, that, like we talked about, those were Utley's games. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that right there is what made him a star player. Well, it didn't last long, Charlie, because in the bottom of the tent, the Braves come right back. Lidge had been perfect in safe situations so far that season. He gets the first batter swinging, but then back-to-back -back singles puts runners on the corners. A stolen base puts runners on second and third, and then he gets Greg Norton striking out, and that will bring up Yunel Escobar. And in my mind, one of the biggest plays of the season, or at least one of the most memorable ones, is about to happen Escobar singles the center. One run scores, makes it 4-3, but here comes Gregor Blanco to the plate, Shane Victorino from center field, and he guns him down. If you go back and look at the play, uh, Shane Victorino charges the ball real hard. He charges the ball real hard, and he and he threw a strike to the plate. He threw a one-hop strike. I, I can remember, definitely yep. you know, remember it, really. And, yeah, and uh, big play, huge play, huge play and a big moment, really. Yeah, no doubt about it. You think about it, you start this uh, the road trip off the right way, you know, with yeah. a big win over, uh, you know, a team that is, is right on your tail, and you do it in dramatic fashion. You come back, then they come back, and you're able to win it. You know, people remember this game. You remember it, and you yeah, call right. it the Victorino game, and what we didn't know at the time was that Brad Lidge was going to then go on and be perfect for the rest of the season in safe situations. Had this one not gone his way, we wouldn't right. be talking about that right now. Right. That's absolutely right. That's absolutely correct. I mean, it, uh, he definitely saved saved us that day, and he saved uh, his arm, saved Lidge. I mean, yeah. you, know, from, you know, like, but because the streak kept going, like you said, big game for us. I mean, I remember an exciting game. I mean, absolutely. Uh, a really good finish to that game. I know our listeners remember it well and can picture that play in their mind right now. All right. Well, you would go on to sweep the Braves and your uh, lead in the East would continue to grow. Uh, we will relive another game coming up in a few weeks with Charlie Manuel. Charlie, always good to see you. Thank you for your time. And I look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks. All right, Murph. Thank you, man. All right. We'll be right back here on Glove Stories with Murph. <laughs> And welcome back to Glove Stories with Murph. It is a real pleasure to welcome in from The Athletic, Phillies beat writer Matt Gelb, who joins us right now to talk a little bit about uh, these 2021 Phils. And Matt, you know, as we sit here and have this conversation, the Phils are one game under 500, and, but they've been kind of swimming in those 500 waters this entire season. It, they're not the only ones, but, but certainly I think a lot of people thought this team was going to be a little bit better consistently than what we're seeing right now. Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of ways of looking at it. Either they're, 
you know, fortunate that the rest of the division has not played well. Uh, and they're also disappointed, I think, because this was an opportunity to get off to a quicker start. And they could have taken advantage of the fact that the rest of the division isn't playing well. The Mets just fired their hitting coach. The Braves have had some injuries. Nationals haven't been uh, as competitive, I think, as we thought they would be. So it's a weird division right now. I think I think what it is, I mean, all these teams are, are good. Uh, the records don't reflect it. I think they're beating up on each other. I really do. And, and, and I think that shows talent in this division. It, it's not reflective right now. But, you know, I, I think the Phillies, when you look at them, uh, in a lot of ways, I think they, they kind of are who we thought they would be. We knew they were going to be sacrificing some defense for offense. The offense hasn't been there uh, on, a, on a consistent basis. Uh, I think one of the more surprising things to me is how uh, they haven't really hit for power outside of Bryce yeah. Harper and Reese Hoskins. They haven't gotten enough power from their other hitters in the lineup. JT Romuto is starting to hit for a little more power, uh, but they, they need more pop. Obviously, they've missed Gene Segura for a little bit. Uh, but they need some pop from Gregorius and McCutcheon and Alec Bohm, who I know isn't necessarily a home run hitter right now at this point in his career, but they, they need more power. Uh, and I think you could say that across the game. It's an, it's crazy, Murph, looking at some of the batting really averages, is. some of the offensive numbers. And maybe it was just an April thing. Uh, maybe it wasn't, though. I, I, I really I, I don't know what it's going to look like when we get to the summer. You know, we heard that uh, Major League Baseball was going to address the actual baseball situation. And uh Apparently they've made it into a, a lead ball that, that will not leave ballparks. Uh, yeah, it, it has been strange. A, a bright spot, obviously, has been Nick Maton. It, this is a kid who's trying to make it very difficult for them to send him back. Uh, can he play another spot when these guys get healthy? They might try. Uh, you know, it's like the issues in center field are well documented. Yeah. Uh, and the fact that Maton has played well uh, could convince him to try him in center field. And I, I, I don't know. I, I think it's you look at it and you're like, Oh, he's athletic. Uh, he, he's got, he's got good foot speed. They have a hole in the center. Let's just put him out there. And it might work. Uh, it might not. <laughs> like they, they already are a really bad defensive team. So I think you have to balance it. You're like, well, do we want to get uh, even worse defensively? Cause let's say, you know, even if Maton is able to play it out there, he's not going to be uh, anything more, I think, than an average defender in center. If they got average defense by sticking Maton at a position he's never played in his life, at the highest level of the sport, I think they'd be ecstatic. So let's say that it's going to be less than that. And, uh, you know, it depends on what they want right now. If they're going to just go all in on being a bad defensive team and a team that's just going to try to out hit their mistakes, then maybe it's worthwhile. I think they could also send him out to the minors for a week or two weeks and just have him play center field every day in the minors and right. see if it works there. Um, it's a good problem to have. I mean, Gene Segura, they need him, to, they need him back. He's going to be back shortly. Uh, they need his presence. He might, honestly, when he comes back, hit at the top of the lineup because of the way McCutcheon has been struggling there. Uh, so the fact that Maton has entered this conversation, he's made it difficult for them, it's terrific. I mean, they, they, need, uh, they need options because Scott Kingery, uh, they thought might be that extra option for them, and he hasn't been that guy yet. So Maton is sort of filling that role now, and uh, I, they might try him in center. I don't know. I mean, Roman Quinn has also been playing a little better of late. So better, yeah. we'll see. Um, they have options, which is something yeah. they didn't have uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, I think they're going to try it. We'll see how it uh, how it all plays out. All right. Hey, before I let you go, this past week, we we saw a lot of weird stuff at the ballpark, which you could probably say at the end of every week. Uh, but we saw a lot of emotion from this team, a lot of uh, – um camaraderie you know if you want to call it that when you're when your benches are clearing and you're and you're facing uh an, an opponent in, in your division um and we also saw some horrific umpiring and and i'm not one to get on the umpires i am not for the robo umps i i don't mind the human error from time to time um but man it, it seems to be particularly bad this year not just um balls and strikes but but some major calls out there in the field as well what are your thoughts on that yeah, I <clears throat> I tend to ignore, you know, the balls and strikes stuff. Like, we, we focus on, like, the one or two that, like, you know, are, are really egregious. But in general, like, I mean, I think the umpires don't know, play the really tough job. And I yeah. actually think they do a decent job in general uh, calling I balls agree. and strikes. Yep. I, I think we tend to focus on the, the one or two outliers every game. And it is part of the human element. I think that's why I love the sport. And I, I love human umpires because there is a little bit of, uh, you know, discrepancies in the strike zone. And so be it. You adjust. Right. But the calls on the bases and the, and some of the judgment calls, just terrible. I mean, the, the call, the McCutcheon call, 
uh, running running up the baseline. It, it's got to be one of the worst calls I've seen in, in now. You know, I've been watching baseball for a long time. I've been covering baseball for 11 years now. And it, it, it's it's probably the, one of the worst calls I've ever seen. Yeah. And I, I think there's just issues with replay. Joe Girardi has talked a lot about it. I think the replay system needs to be looked at. I really do. I think they need sort of an NFL style replay where, you know, maybe they get buzzed down from an umpire, uh, somebody who's sitting in the replay center in New York or an umpire who's sitting upstairs in the ballpark. Uh, the challenge system, I feel like is kind of, it's just not broken. And uh, there's a lot of plays that aren't reviewable. That was a play that was not reviewable. And I think that expanding it, uh, but still making it quick. Some of these reviews are, are taking too long. They need to find a way to make it quicker and also <laughs> just make more plays reviewable. They want to get calls right. That's the goal of the replay system. And I think there's too many calls that aren't, that haven't been right so far this year outside of balls and strikes. Right. And I, and I'm with you lockstep and, and, and I agree uh, balls and strikes. They are what they are. They even out during, during a game, they even out during a a week, a series, whatever you, Um, and, and the human element is a, is a fun part of baseball, but if you're going to have replay and the idea is to get it right. I mean, we saw earlier, it benefited the Phillies, uh, the play at home plate, you know, first week of the season against the Braves, I guess it was. Uh, so, you know, th- again, they even out. However, that was pretty egregious the other night. Yeah. Um, and no one wants more replay. I don't think we want no. that, but we, but we want more correct calls. And I think exactly. if they can get more correct calls while making it quicker. Now that sounds, it seems probably easier said than done. Right. Well, I think it is easier than they make it appear. You know, anytime you're looking at something for a minute and a half, it's not conclusive. So move on. It, yep. it, it, to me, if, if you can't figure it out in 30 seconds, then then it, the play stands as called, good yep. or bad. But that's the thing. So that's the way I look at it. Well, Matt Gelb, I appreciate it. Always good to talk to you. Uh, and, uh, you know, we'll enjoy seeing you down at the ballpark over the course of the week. Thanks for being with us. Good to see you, Murph. Glove Stories with Murph is a presentation of SBC Media Partners. The engineer for Glove Stories is Chad Evans. Cindy Webster is our marketing and guest relations director. And our executive producer is Roger Hatton. Whether you are watching us on YouTube or downloading the podcast from one of the major podcast providers like Apple or Google or Spotify, make sure to hit like or subscribe so that we can let you know when a new episode of Glove Stories is available. We will release new episodes weekly through the 2021 Major League Baseball season.